What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. I am Charlie Marlowe, and we have another Charlie, or Charles, should I say, Charles D'Angelo, weight loss coach, joining us. Charles, how you doing, man? My pleasure. I'm doing great. All right, let's just start. Let's start here. Tell people first, before we get to your story, just what exactly do you do? So for those people who've never seen me, I was 360 pounds as a kid. I weighed 360. I had a size 50 inch waist. The simplest things, going up four stairs, getting from the car to the curb, talking to other people, all those things were very difficult for me. Uh, I was morbidly overweight. My health was really at risk. And I had tried everything. I had tried the diets. I tried the pills. I had tried the machines, all these different methods and approaches. And despite my sincere efforts as a kid, I found that something was missing. And that something I came to realize was the mindset. How do you really change the way you think? How do you really change the way you address food, you address yourself? How do you disconnect from using food in an emotional way? And in two years of personal work, I lost 160 pounds. And that was when I was in high school. And my life was on fire. I mean, everything was better. I had so much energy, I had so much confidence. And I thought, my goodness, this was so simple. It wasn't as complicated as I had imagined it to be. And so I made it my mission to help other people. And now for the last 20 plus years, um, it's the only thing I've done is, is helping other people change the way they think. And by doing so, change their habits and change their life. Okay. So when you were in high school, what shifted for you though? Did you have a coach or did you read a book? You said you tried everything. Obviously, eventually you figured it out. What, what was the point where you figured it out and how did that happen? So I always tell people, the how is not nearly as important as the why. We all have to get to a place where we're so focused on the reasons that change has to be a must that we're willing to do whatever's necessary to do it. So it really wasn't something mechanical. It wasn't some magical plan. It wasn't some piece of exercise equipment. It wasn't some program. It was really a shift in philosophy, changing my philosophy about myself, starting to value myself enough to actually make daily deposits of discipline so that I would start to move in the direction of the goals I had. There wasn't one specific thing that resulted in me deciding that moment really was at hand. All of us have a series of events usually when we make any change happen. For me, it was I was in a classroom and I was about to take an exam and my heart was just beating out of my chest. Uh, I was sweating profusely. I was looking down at the, the test and there were droplets of sweat hitting the exam. And I remember looking outside the classroom door and the nurse, the school nurse, walked by and she looked at me and she motioned for me to, to come out there and she wanted to take my blood pressure, but I wouldn't let her. I was just too fearful of facing what might really be a, a problem I was having. And so I had this, this moment where I realized that if I wasn't going to make serious changes, I might not live to see my high school graduation. And that was that was kind of a really big transition for me of realizing, my gosh, I'm 17, I'm 360 pounds, I hadn't dated any girls, um, I, I never played sports as a kid. I recognized that life was really passing me by and I wanted to get a lot more from my life. I didn't wanna just continue to go through my life. So when we're about to make a change, we've got to get disturbed. And so we've got to let things kind of accumulate to the place where we feel that it's it's a must. Not another week, not another month, not another year is going to go by and I'm going to live this way. And so those types of events had stacked up. I, I made the decision that I was going to change and the rest has been history. I started to commit to a real healthy way of eating, nothing exotic or crazy, um, and exercising routinely and being consistent. That's really for most people what's missing is most people have uh, a rather clear idea of what's healthy and what isn't, but they find it difficult to do what they know. They find it difficult to stay consistent. And that's why I've come in my life to coaching people, helping them not only develop a high resolution strategy of exactly what to do, knowing what to eat, when to eat, where to get it from, but also how is it you're going to be able to stay committed when difficulties come up in life, when you're or when you have kids or when you go through a career shift or any number of challenges that any of us might face. Okay. So when you're coaching folks now, and I'm guessing you can tell me you're coaching folks of different ages, 
is the mindset or or basically the strategy the same for like a high school kid like you were 20 some years ago or let's say a 50 year old 60 year old and then as i'm thinking i'm also wondering you you basically started your coaching career kind of with the evolution of social media for kids and smartphones so i'm also wondering as i as i think about this question it's got to be kind of a different strategy with with folks that are teenagers than it was when you were a teenager because man the whole world has changed with smartphones with social media and all that stress and pressure and just kids looking at their phone all day long so in all the years that i've been coaching while technology has changed people haven't so we all still feel certain emotions with a, a negative valence that is uh, we feel fear or sadness or anger and my work with people is helping them disconnect from using food in most cases as a treatment plan of sorts. So while technology does pull at us more than ever before, the work is still the same. It's learning how to be present, maintain consistency with an intelligent high resolution strategy, building on success, managing to make progress, developing momentum, and then once achieving the goal, learning how to sustain that through integrating in, in the case of weight loss, other food choices, setting new goals, further in your horizon, looking ahead and perhaps starting to do weight training. So you're constantly having something that's compelling that helps you move forward. A lot of people struggle because they achieve an outcome, but they don't set a new goal. So it's really about continuing to expand your horizon and make progress. So while technology has become something that's so far more, so much more integral in all of our lives, what we need to do in the face of distraction is still the same. We need to remain present, be in the now, allow ourselves to feel what we're feeling instead of looking for a way around those feelings that are uncomfortable. And when we really work on mastering that, the things that so many people get hooked by don't have the grip that they once did on us. So when people are overweight, it's a very, it's a very physical thing, but from talking with you over the years and we had you on the radio the other day and, and listening to you, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that, usually the underlying factor is something more inside of us, something more mental. Is that, is that fair to say? Absolutely. I always tell people that in now 20 years of coaching, I found it's never about the food. It's what are you doing with food that's in some way a distraction or some way trying to console yourself uh, in the face of something. In other words, there's something going on that might feel overwhelming, and it's much more convenient to have something that you distract yourself with than it is to really tackle the issue at hand. So I, I really work with people on confronting those things that might be troubling them, that food has become kind of a convenient outlet from really addressing. You know, you're turning away from the issue and you're creating kind of a straw man problem. You know, a person is unsatisfied in their life. They're not happy with their career. They're not happy with their relationship or they feel lonely or they're angry and they haven't dealt with it. It's helping people really disconnect from using food in such an unhealthy way so that whatever it is that's in front of them can be better addressed and managed. Okay. So I'm just curious. I'm thinking about myself here. Now I could lose 10 to 15 pounds. You know, I, I, I could do that. I do like to work out. I really started working out recently again, last, like, let's say six or months or so. I feel like my issue is my wife makes really good food and I eat too much. Even at the end, when I know I'm full, I'll have another helping because it tastes good. So what's my problem? Do I just need to, A, put the fork down? Well, sometimes it can be something as simple as not having a sound strategy. So you're making yourself vulnerable to overeating. When you're not giving yourself what you need, you'll find you're never able to get enough of those things that you don't need. You just constantly and continually put more and more of the things in that aren't satisfying you. So it's kind of like, to use a metaphor, it's kind of like trying to live off of cotton candy. It's you feel good when it goes in, but it doesn't last long. So one aspect of change is healthy eating. So I always talk about the success that I help people achieve working with me as a three-legged stool. You have to have a healthy and intelligent and strategic and high resolution, precise eating schedule. You have to have a, a routine for yourself that invariably stands the test of time every day that you you can stay consistent with it so that you eat on the schedule so you're not leaving yourself vulnerable to your point to being unnecessarily hungry and susceptible to temptations that otherwise you wouldn't be tempted by when you feel satisfied there's no need for you to reach for something you don't really have any 
purpose in, in eating. But if you have, haven't eaten all day, um, you've eaten choices of foods that aren't satisfying your body, then you're going to find yourself compulsively almost putting more and more of the wrong things in. So one leg of this, this whole success stool is healthy eating and having a really clear plan. The second part is having a consistent pattern of exercise. So that second leg is exercise. So you've got to have healthy eating. You've got to have exercise. My exercise, I recommend when I work with people, starting with just cardio, getting into a routine of walking every single day. My clients walk for, on average, 30 minutes on a treadmill, seven days a week. And you create a ritual for yourself. We all have patterns and rituals, but so many of them are unconscious. You know, we're doing a lot of the same things over and over. They're just not leading us in the direction that we want to move in. So a lot of the work is actually defining where is it you want to go and then setting up a strategy, working backward from that aim, such that you're able to start to move in that direction. And lastly, the third leg of this three-legged stool and, and what's missing in my estimation and everything else out there is how do you develop the right psychology, the right mindset? How do you disconnect from using food in the way you just described? Uh, and then eventually learn how to reconnect so you can have a really healthy working relationship with food where it's not something that takes up more space in your life than it ought to. Okay, how about men versus women? I'm curious, is it pretty equal in terms of, of who's overweight, men versus women? And also, are there different strategies to coach a man versus a woman? I got a bunch of questions in one here. And also, do you think, do men become overweight for different reasons than women do? Or at the core, is it all kind of the same stuff? So there are three questions in, in there. They overlap, but they're distinctly different. So obviously, biologically, we are different from a gender perspective. Uh, hormonally, we're different. Physiologically, we're different. But the principles that underlie change are, in my experience, uh, predominantly the same. You have to have a really compelling reason that gets you up early and keeps you up late if you want to change. Uh, you have to have a set of goals and aims that are exciting, that bring about a certain anticipation every day, that you're actually looking forward to the day, that you're willing to make the necessary sacrifices day in and day out to move in the direction of the goals that you have. I just got off a call before you and I began this, this conversation with a person who'd like to become a client. And this person is struggling with the idea of having to give up alcohol for a period of time so that he's able to start to make progress. Because the thing that's really uh, at issue for him is the spontaneity at which he drinks. There's, there's no real predictability. And if you want to have success in anything, you've got to have a plan. There is, th success doesn't happen by accident. Success happens because of intention and because of a schedule, because of a routine. If you want success to be something that you enjoy, you have to have a plan for it. You have to have accountability that's ensuring that you're moving in that direction because there's always in life wins that blow on us. Challenges, unexpected circumstances, losses, things that are uh, wins too, things that are exciting that we might want to use food in a way that's not necessarily healthy. There are all these winds of life that blow on all of us. And the only way we can continue to move in the direction of our goals is to continue to adjust the sail on our, our ship uh, in life so we are using the wind to our advantage. So while we're biologically different uh, from a gender perspective, the psychology of change um, is unique, but in many ways the same for all of us. You have to get disturbed by where you are. Uh, you wanna put yourself in an environment that motivates you, that excites you. You wanna put yourself in a room where you're not the most successful, fit, healthy person, that the people around you are playing the game of life at even a higher level and, and being around them, that really gets you activated and gets you charged up at wanting to raise your game. So I always tell people, if you're stuck in a place you're unhappy, put yourself around people that are happy and start to really examine and study what is it that allows for them to have that success or that happiness. Because if you study anything, you can learn the patterns that allow for that to be the reality that you experience. Anything can be learned. Uh, but you have to be willing to put yourself in that uncomfortable position of first acknowledging those areas of your life you're not really satisfied with. And then learning from those people that have mastered that specific area, which requires we have humility and we have a willingness to continue to grow and evolve as a person. Okay, so you said you're talking with your potential client about alcohol, and I'm not sure if that person is an alcoholic or not, but I think the, the subject of alcohol is is very interesting. 
I, I enjoy drinking alcohol. Now, back in the day, in college, I binge drank and drank a ton. And obviously, as you, you get older, you drink less. I have two kids now. And even though I still enjoy drinking a couple beers, I think to myself, what's, what's even the value as a 41-year-old in drinking anymore? Again, I love to have a couple beers at dinner, but man, it wrecks you. The next day, I'm lethargic. With my kids, I have less energy. I'm definitely less likely to work out a day, even if I have two, three, four beers. So how do you think alcohol plays into all this? Not just for, for folks who may be addicted, but man, as I get older, again, I like beer, but alcohol really is poison. So I have never drank use any illegal drug, not because I'm puritanical, but because I came from a family of addiction. My mother uh, lost her life to the ravaging effects of abusing alcohol at just 51. So I have never wanted to even flirt with the idea of using something like that. Um, what I found, although I avoided those types of issues, uh, I became incredibly entangled in an unhealthy relationship with food as a kid. Uh, and I think what happens for a lot of us when we, there's two things about what you mentioned um, in your experience with alcohol. It's not uncommon at all for any of us as adolescents to try to find out our own limits by pushing them. That's kind of natural. So drink too much, do this too much. And we kind of find just how much can we tolerate? So there's there something that seems to be instinctually natural about testing our own limits in that stage of life. So it's not surprising. But when it becomes something that interferes with your ability to enjoy your life, uh, when it is taken away from the mission you have as a person, when it's a good working definition of addiction could be pursuing one thing at the expense of everything else. When you're willing to sacrifice everything for one thing, that's when you know you really need to look at what's going on with you. When that becomes the most important thing in your world, uh, and it sounds like as you've grown as a man with a family and children and responsibilities, uh, you've started to, as all of us do, look more toward the medium to long-term goals that you have for yourself. When we're younger, we don't have as much awareness of the, the finitude of life. We don't really think about our own mortality, but as we get older and we see our peers getting sick, we see those people that love us passing on, the people we love passing on, when our parents pass, we have to confront the reality that we are in some way moving closer and closer to the front of that line. And so we start to think more about the future, not only for ourselves, but for the legacy we're going to leave as men, for our children, for our partner, so on and so forth. So while part of it is, is testing the limits as a younger person, as an adult, what you want to think about with alcohol or any other substance or any other habit is when it's a low level gratifier like food or alcohol, that tells you that you're really not maximizing the other areas of your life as much as you could. Because if your primary recreation and primary joy is drinking or, you know, going through the drive through that tells you there's something missing in your life. If that's the primary vehicle by which you achieve some sense of pleasure every day, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of sad when you think about that. Uh, we want to really get the equities of life from the domain should. And what I found in my life is most of those things we're seeking out and looking for come from relationships. And if we've had a particularly difficult life, if our early life as children uh, was one in which we never really were able to form secure attachments to other people, or we went through a lot of abuse or a lot of trauma, and we develop um, a philosophy of distrust of people and of humanity, well, then it doesn't surprise us to find that people are looking for things that are predictable, that are unchanging, that are constant, given that they've never had constancy, predictability, any of those things that we want to have in a healthy relationship. So people form relationships with things that they never really can get anything back from. And they find themselves very hollowed out as they continue down that path. So it's really about asking yourself if you're caught up in a pattern of overeating or abusing drugs or alcohol or any other substance, what's missing in my life? What am I really trying to get out of this? You know, as a father, a father of two children and a wife, both myself and you share that, um, there's a lot of pressure on a man. 
And that pressure sometimes can lead us to try to calm ourselves down, uh, reassure ourselves, um, give ourselves um, an outlet when the pressures we're experiencing feel to be more than what we at some level believe we can handle. So you want to be very careful that you don't use something that comes at an incredibly high price, medium to long term, just to try to make yourself feel better in the moment. How do you think overall fitness also benefits folks? Let's say in the in the business world. I feel like I've seen this. You see this not, not just with billionaires, but maybe you have friends or successful people. I, I do feel like as I get older, I'm in my early 40s. It seems like, and I'm sure you can tell me, there seems like a direct correlation many times into people who are very into fitness and health and, and business success, whether that comes down to just time management and energy. I feel like I've really seen that. And you can even look at like a Jeff Bezos or a Mark Zuckerberg, what they used to look like. And then, you know, they get into fitness, but I have tons of friends and I feel like a lot of them that are very successful are in very good health and they work out and they're fit. What's the correlation there? Do you think? Well, I think that axiom as within, so without is something that you're you're bringing forth in your example. That is, how we think is reflected in how we feel, how we look, the way we show up. And if you change your thinking about yourself, if you start to see yourself as athletic, as disciplined, as focused, and thereby you start to shift your behaviors, obviously the outward will start to reflect that set of beliefs and those sets of behaviors. The, the thing that people want to recognize about fitness is, it requires a certain comfort with discomfort because when you work out, you are going to feel pain after. You're going to be sore if you do a good enough job. It requires a certain comfort with delayed gratification because you're not going to become fit and healthy overnight. I always tell people we can't change where you are overnight, but we can change the direction you're headed overnight. So when you become someone who's committed to health and fitness, it's a shift in your philosophy. You're starting to make daily investments that consistent pattern of working out accumulates over time. So it's not at all unusual for me to have clients tell me that as they're losing weight, as they're becoming disciplined in their eating, as they're making exercise a regular ritual every day, that they start to get the rest of their life in order. They start to be more disciplined in their spending. They start to pull down on their debt. They start to get their house physically more organized, both because they have more energy, but also because they're starting to think about what is it I really want my life to look like? So I think the, the philosophy of physical fitness, the philosophy of bodybuilding, the philosophy of lifting weights has application in all the other areas of your life, in relationships, in finances, um, in your career. You can take the, the disciplines that you learn in weight loss or in fitness and apply them to these other areas and in doing so, improve those other areas too. For men specifically, when you said about your story, you're 360 pounds, you hadn't dated anybody. And this this ties into the fitness thing. For, for a man and your ego and all that, clearly if you're in better shape, you are going to have a better chance of, of being with a woman. H how important and how much are those linked? For example, do you think some people, do they almost become overweight? Are they... Are they scared to get in a relationship? And they know there's a better chance that, hey, if I'm overweight, I'm not going to have to put myself out there. And then do you do you see stories of these men who lose a ton of weight and all of a sudden they get a girlfriend, they get a wife and they they see the value there and it just kind of changes everything for the better? Yeah, so you have some really good questions and they're complex questions. And the really the devil's in the details of what you're asking, because everyone's a little different. For some people, if they have, my experience has been, if they have fear about commitment or about relationship or about their own identity, sometimes one way of keeping themselves from ever having to deal with that is in their own mind, making themselves unavailable. So they make it so that they never have to confront the threat of intimacy by becoming physiologically in their own estimation, um, a person who would be able to have the type of partner that they wish for or deserve. When we see plenty of people who are overweight that have partners, have no issue. So it's, it's sometimes a defense, it certainly can be. Uh, at other times, it can be something that we do, we allow ourselves to neglect 
our own self-care because we don't really have uh, the degree of self-love that we ought to have. We've put everyone else ahead of ourselves. We grew up perhaps in a uh, family setting where we were the caretakers for our parents. And so we never really learned what it looks like to have healthy boundaries. We never learned what it looks like to take care of ourselves. We were always in some ways taking care of everyone else. And if that goes unaddressed, well, it's easy to be something that gets perpetuated. And so there's many reasons that we use food or any number of other things um, to the degree that they really complicate our lives. I think that what we all have to do is trust that we can handle intimacy. And that's a scary thing for people because the truth about intimacy, if you look at the word intimacy, it's in to me see. That is, you're looking into me. You're actually letting someone see into you. And that is a scary notion for a lot of men, uh, a scary notion for a lot of women, but speaking here as men, the idea of letting someone see all that you are and trusting that they're still going to love and like you is a very scary thing for people. If everyone knows what you're really like, everyone knows all the things that you're embarrassed about, uh, the things that you feel shame over, the things you feel scared about, that's a scary thing because there's the possibility of that person rejecting you. And all of us have two fears, that we're not enough, that we're not as good as the next person, and thereby we're not going to be loved. And because we're human and we have such a long period of dependency as children, we believe that if we don't have other people's love, we're not going to survive. There's an actual instinctual wiring that if we're not part of the group, if we don't have that, that source, if we don't have that coming into us, well, then our ability to continue to move forward is threatened. That's why you see people that do all sorts of crazy things when they feel like they're not good enough or they're unlovable. We have to develop a certain capacity to start to show ourselves as adults that we're lovable by treating ourselves as someone we really care about. So the idea of treating yourself like you would your best friend. You know, would you talk to yourself like you do your best friend? Would you... Would you talk to your best friend like you do yourself? Would you say the things you say in your head to someone you really care about? And if the answer to those things is no, then you really want to start to rework that script and start to catch yourself. You know, when you put yourself down or when you're overly critical, judgmental, harsh, uncaring, inconsiderate towards yourself. And if you start to do that, what you'll find is you can become for yourself who you always needed. So a lot of people are looking for validation, looking for supply outside of themselves, when what they need has always been staring back at them in the mirror. You said earlier, I think you used the term daily deposits, which I like. And I've found whether it's fitness, health, it is kind of boring. Sometimes we overcomplicate it, but it is to me, it's daily, the working out every day, the walking or the cardio every day, the diet every day. I mean, literally every day for days and months and weeks and years and all that. So I guess I would call it, tell me if it's fair to say, I think some people may be taking the, the easy way out with the injections these days. The Ozempic is a big thing a lot of people are talking about. So just I'll throw it to you. What, what's your thought on, on this way of losing weight, which seems to be pretty popular these days? So my focus with people is our change isn't so much on the dividend of weight loss. The, the weight loss is a dividend. It's not even the focus. The, the focus with me is how are we going to embrace a strategy of behavior change so that you're not only able to reach your goal, but you're able to sustain it. The only thing I've found that's been sustainable for both myself, having been fit and healthy for over 20 years and in the lives of my clients who've kept their weight off is behavioral change. If you don't change the associations you have to the things that are problematic, what's going to stop you from going back to those things when life gets difficult again? So when you are stressed out, or let's say you're in a relationship and your spouse passes away, or you have a child and that child falls ill, or you get fired. Well, if your primary way of attending to stress or sadness or anger has been using a particular substance like food, what's all of a sudden going to be different just because you've lost weight through some, you know, whatever particular approach you've chosen to take? Unless you learn how to really change your mindset, change your thinking, I think you're setting yourself up for a lot of disappointment. 
Okay, tell tell folks about some of your great transformation stories. And I know you have some celebrity clients like Tom Arnold and others. Doesn't have to be about Tom, but just ordinary people. But also, I know some some high achievers. You said you work with a lot of doctors. Give give folks some some of your great transformation stories. You know, the people that are just everyday people impact me just as much as the people that are public figures. Um, the people that impress me most are those people that continue to show up and want to make changes despite a history of all sorts of challenge, despite a biography of incredible difficulty. I have, I have young people that have been abused. I have young people who have lost loved ones. I have, loved, I have uh, young people that um, have witnessed just atrocious, horrible things. And to be able to witness the human spirit and strength in particularly the young, because I think that when we're adults, we have more of an awareness of our own resourcefulness and we have oftentimes more resources at our disposal. But when you see a young person muster up the strength and the grit and the will to grab life uh, by its horns and to really do what they can to transform their lives, it's incredibly moving to me. You know, I think of a client who witnessed suicide when he was a very little boy and he turned to food as a means of trying to comfort himself in the wake of parents grief and his own grief yet a few years later he came to a similar epiphany as i did and he said i, I if my life's going to be different i'm going to have to change and so he was willing to make those sacrifices starting to be consistent in health eating uh, routine exercise and then seeing me every couple of weeks and you know he's lost over 80 pounds he's kept it off for a few years now and his life's on fire. So when I see young people really muster what it takes and have the privilege of coaching in their process, uh, it's an incredibly rewarding and fulfilling experience for me. I, I consider what I do a vocation. I don't consider it a job. I've been incredibly blessed and fortunate, and I consider this my calling. I've been doing it for 20 plus years, and I've seen lots of people come and go from the industry. And this has just been something that I've always found tremendous meaning in. I absolutely love it. Um, and I, I, I don't think there's anything greater than being able to make, as we talked about, a deposit in the life of another person, because that ripples out. You know, it's cool when I, I see a person who's in the public eye and they change their life and they share it and it reaches lots of people because that furthers the mission of showing people change is really possible. But it's just as meaningful uh, to me as a high school student who's been bullied, who's never been on a date and having been through the process and developed confidence in themselves through doing so is now sitting in, in the cafeteria at lunch with a group of friends, is going out to parties on the weekend, um, has a confidence to ask a girl out or a guy out on a date. Those types of things matter to me just as much as, you know, the person that's in movies that shares that they work with me. So how about just the obesity epidemic in this country? We've all seen the pictures. They'll show a picture from 1965, whatever, on the beach, and everybody looks skinny. Then you see the picture from 2023, 20, 2024, 20, and so many people are obese. Obviously, we have a lot of bad food out there, a lot of fast food, sedentary lifestyles. People are driving in cars. They're not walking as much to work like they were back in the day. I mean, how do we turn this thing around? It, it does really seem like, man, I've gone out sometimes you go to, a, I don't know, an amusement park or something. You just go out in public. And sometimes, and look, I, I need to lose a couple pounds myself. But sometimes it is pretty astonishing when you look around and you do see how heavy we are as a people these days. Yes, statistically, we're heavier than ever. And the advent of all these different interventions, people are desperately seeking to try to change the tide. I think that if those things were the answer, we wouldn't see the problem you're describing. I think that the problem you're describing is complex, but at the same time, its resolution is quite simple. And that is, you've got to embrace and accept the, the given that to have lasting change comes at the price of sacrifice. And no one likes to hear that. No one likes to hear that if I'm really going to have a higher quality of life, it's going to come at a price. And the price is, I'm going to have to endure some short-term pain uh, that being discipline in the service of avoiding regret. So I don't end up 50 years old on a host of medications, having had a stent put in because I had a cardiac event, so on and so forth. So the way we change this is first and foremost, 
becoming more present with where we each are in terms of what we're feeling. So many of us are pursuing things, more achievement, more money, more status, uh, trying to fill something in ourselves with things that never, ever do the job. And for a lot of people, because of, as you said, the convenience, the accessibility, uh, the poor quality of many of the options that people have at their disposal, they're doing that using food. It's a, it's a state changer. Food changes your state, just like alcohol does. So the real work is how you develop fitness emotionally so you don't have to use something like that to alter how you're feeling. When you can learn better strategies, when you can outgrow that type of strategy, you're no longer imprisoned to that substance. Now you have the power to change your life because you know how to change how you're feeling without having to turn turn to something that's outside of yourself. So how about the concept of, of body positivity? Obviously, you know, I would never and no one should ever body shame other people. I think about COVID though, how I feel like it did seem like we weren't allowed to say, or people weren't allowed to say, hey, we need to be healthier. We need to be fitter. This is a huge part of this. Arguably the number one component of getting sick from this is, is being obese. And I just wonder, because look, to me, whatever you find beautiful is fine. That's good. That's good with me. But I, I don't think as a society, we should encourage or say that being that big is healthy. That's different than, hey, if you like a bigger person, you can still be beautiful, but I don't think we should try to promote that that's healthy. What do you think about that? Sure. So first off, in all my years of coaching, I found really early on that telling someone what to do hardly ever works. So by telling someone you shouldn't be this, I mean, hell, we can't even get ourselves to make changes when we tell ourselves we shouldn't be a certain way. So <laughs> what makes you think that we should be able to tell someone else you shouldn't be doing that and they're going to act? Listen, my, my success has come in, in two different ways. One, modeling what's possible for a person. I'm not so concerned about the societal opinion. I'm more concerned about do people recognize how rich and how abundant and how fulfilling life can really be. And is my example something that they can look to to recognize that reality? So when I have a person come in here, the last thing that I'm going to do is try to persuade or coerce them into seeing that there's something off with the way they're living. Because until and unless, as you probably know in your own life, how many things do you know that if you stop doing them, your life would be better, but you keep doing them? <laughs> you don't need to tell you that. You know, I mean, when you someone, you don't need them to tell you that. How helpful is that going to be that someone says, you know, you really ought not to be doing that? You know it. The, the trouble is, is that a lot of people have shame about them, them shame about that themselves. You know, shame is about who you are. Guilt is about something you're doing. So I don't think any of us should have shame about anything. I don't think that we should have shame about anything. Uh, I think that we should have regret about things, things that we're doing that we know aren't a deposit in the quality of life that we deserve to have. But each of us have to come to a place that we feel like we're not living life at the standard or on the terms that we've defined matter to us. And I think the greatest gift we can give other people, my experience has been, and when I first started years ago, uh, I had a reputation for being very militant, much like a drill sergeant. And as I've grown older and more mature, and I'm married and I've had children, you recognize that life has a way of softening you because you see the incredible suffering of other people. Life is really difficult for everyone. It is really difficult. When you look at people and you just think they have it all together, you're kidding yourself. And I can say that because I've had the privilege of sitting across from thousands of people from all walks of life, all socioeconomic statuses. And without question, every single one of those people have all sorts of challenges. It doesn't matter if they're a brain surgeon who lives in a $10 million home and has a Bentley and a, and a Range Rover and a, a wife that's a supermodel. That person is just as vulnerable to life's difficulties as the person who's 
working for the sewer department. They may have more resources to deal with some some problems or, or issues that the other person doesn't, but they're just as vulnerable to the type of existential issues we all have to contend with. Loneliness, isolation, a sense of meaninglessness in life. These are things all of us have to think about as we get older. So my, my opinion is if you can bring compassion to people, if you can communicate a sincere, loving interest in another person, you can really find that that will have more of an indelible impact than any directive that you're going to give them. When people have, have said, I've had a, a meaningful influence, it's often because they say, not of what I said to them or what I did for them, but how having a relationship with me made them feel. So if, if you can create a relationship with people where it's one where they feel understood, they feel who they are is acceptable and lovable, and at the same time, that might mean that they know you disapprove of some choices they're making because those choices are not in the service of who they want to be or who they could become. I think that that's what really stands to be able to help people change. I think simply saying, you know, you're doing it all wrong. Here's what you ought to do. Let me let me do that. You're kind of robbing the person of their own success, because if even if I'm right and I say, here's what you need to do and they do it. Well, how much better they feel about themselves if I'm the one that solved the problem? So I think the best thing we can do in terms of this body positivity thing is recognize that there's no need for any of us to feel shame about who we are. We may very well, because of our own understanding, come to places where we recognize what we're doing isn't in the service of who we could ultimately be, not to ourselves and not to others. And then you might have regret about those choices. And that's a simple and uh, easily rectifiable issue. Change those choices. You don't need to beat yourself up. You don't have to live in guilt about them. Guilt is uh, actually a positive uh, emotion when it informs you of something you want to change. It's telling you, hey, I have a standard here and what I'm doing isn't meeting that standard. And so that, that negative feeling tells you, look, if you change that behavior, you can achieve a, a better state emotionally. But if that goes on and on and on and you just feel guilty all the time, you're, you're wasting your energy. You know, either accept where you are and be cool with it, which is perfectly fine. Everyone has a right. No one's going to come and arrest you if you're going to have a heart attack. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if you eat yourself into a prison of sorts, like I almost did, you know, the authorities aren't going to come knocking at your door and come put you in jail for it. You know, you're the one that has to live with the consequences of those choices. Um, I see... I see no real benefit to pointing out to another person, here's where you're doing it all wrong. I think um, you can be more sophisticated and the more sophisticated way would be modeling how much better life could be with a different set of choices and letting that person through their own experience encounter that and then come to their own conclusion in doing so if they're interested, then they'll ask, hey, you know, man, it looks like your life really works out. Like, you really, you're in great shape and you have a great marriage. You are successful financially. Like, you know, how, how do you do that? And if, if that happens, I think that's, that, that's where the opening for change really is. Okay. Well, we'll get close to, to wrapping up with this. I fired a bunch of questions at you. W what did I miss for folks that are looking for help from you? What are some other keys that I didn't ask you about in, in terms of these folks turning their lives around? I think the, the biggest thing I want to communicate is that it's possible that we have enough experience, enough data to conclude that it's possible for you to change if you're willing to shift your habits. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter how many things you tell yourself you've tried, that if you have a willingness to do something different, the next year of your life could be the best year ever. But you'll have to invest everything that you have learned, everything you've accrued, up to the stage of your life into that next year. And if you're willing to do that, it doesn't matter your history. It doesn't matter what story you have. It doesn't matter what people have said about you. You can make this next life, this next year of your life, the best year you've ever had in your life. And it will be simply through a change of choices, a change of habits. Look around you and look for the people that are living life the way you want to live. Learn as much as you can from those people. Start to practice those disciplines and your life will start to move in that direction. 
That's awesome. All right, Charles, tell folks uh, where they can find you on social media or to contact you if somebody is very overweight and looking to get help from you. I, I know you're here in St. Louis with me, even though we're not together right now. We're both in St. Louis, but with the with the modern era of Zoom and StreamYard, I'm guessing you can talk to people all over the world, really, also. That's, I have clients all over the country and even outside the U.S. The best way of getting a hold of me is just going to my website. It's charlesdangelo.com. There's a simple form. You put your name, your email address, your phone number. Either I personally will call you or a member of my team will. We'll talk about your situation, set up a time to meet, whether it be if you're wanting to come here in the office and meet with me, that's fine. Or if you want to meet with me via Zoom, either is, is fine with me. The most important thing to know about that is, is that there's nothing in between you and the you you want to be, but you. You've just have to you have to be willing to make these shifts in your behaviors and if you feel like you've tried everything and nothing works i'm here to tell you i certainly haven't met you yet and you can make these changes things will start to change and once you get to your goal you'll learn how to maintain that weight that's awesome charles this is really fun man thanks for doing this we should do this every once in a while and uh folks he just gave you the information reach out to him this is really fun thanks charles my pleasure thanks for having me charlie